Okay, well, in the interest of keeping us on schedule, um, let me call us all back to order. Um, I think you know, again, I'm Elizabeth Parker, the dean here. Uh, I must say, this is the first opportunity I've ever had to follow the first lawyer in the land. Uh, President Obama is more articulate than I'll ever hope to be, but uh, certainly it's wonderful that we have such a timely topic. Um, I have a wonderful panel that I'm going to be introducing, but I thought before I did that, I would just uh, put this in the McGeorge context, if you'd indulge me. I arrived here as dean about eight years ago, and one of the first things that happened was the Third District Court of Appeals invited me for lunch. And I was kind of struck by that. The whole court came and invited me to lunch with them at their gorgeous uh, chambers or ceremonial courtroom. And the next thing that happened, with some embarrassment, the chief judge of the federal district court called and said, well, he was sorry he was late. Uh, would, would I come to lunch with, with them as well? <clears throat> oh, my goodness. And then the Northern District of California called and said, would I please come and have lunch with them? They had, and I thought, this is really amazing. I mean, here are these judges. I'm this kind of peon in it all. And then Justice Kennedy uh, called, and this began a pattern where Justice Kennedy would call, and uh, sometimes he would say with a little bit of a touch of humor, he has a wonderful sense of humor, hello, Dean, um, I'm going to spend your money again. Is that all right? And what he meant was he had been sent by the State Department somewhere in the world to meet with one leader or another, and what he liked to do was extend an invitation to our Salzburg program uh, to those uh, heads of states because he believed that uh, educating lawyers around the world, and judges too, was something of, of his role in all of this. And the more I thought about this, I thought, well, this is kind of unusual. Um, and then I would get calls from the district court, would I do this, would I do that? And then one day, Justice Nicholson, again on the Third District Court of Appeals, called me and kind of shook his finger at me over the phone and said, now, we're not getting enough uh, of your students here in an externship program. In fact, we're not getting any of them. And I demand, I mean, he was really insistent that you implement a program where we can have your students uh, spending a, an externship time with us. And of course, it wasn't a hard sell. It's a great thing. But he essentially pushed this through. We've had something like 255 students in those kinds of positions as a result. But I began to reflect on it, and suddenly it dawned on me. I thought I was coming to be the dean of a law school. And that much was true, but I hadn't understood my role fully. It was to be the action arm of the judiciary. And so suddenly I began to look at these calls in a little bit different way. And that's another reason, I think, why I thought this particular topic today was so wonderful. But it was also why when, <clears throat> I think it was maybe a little over two years ago, I had a call from Justice George that I said yes before he asked the question. And that was, would I be willing to serve as a member uh, of the uh, commission that he was creating on an import, imp, pardon me, impartial court system for California? And that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, now, the three speakers that I have the good fortune to introduce as a result of the wonderful uh, book that you all have in front of you really don't need a great deal of introduction because they are thoroughly described there and I would call your attention to their remarkable accomplishments. Were I to read all of that, we would be here for a long time. And so let me simply say that we're going to begin with Justice Ron Roby, who is on our Court of Appeal at the Third District here in uh, Sacramento. Uh, he will uh, also talk about the commission because he was um, one of the members of the executive committee. It was chaired by Justice Chin. Uh, Justice Roby is a graduate of Berkeley, two degrees there, both a BA and an MA in pardon me, journalism. And then I'm pleased to say that he uh, is a graduate as well of McGeorge. He has taught with us for how many years, may I tell them? 1970. 1970. And interestingly, uh, he's taught in water and environmental areas because that was his specialty before he went on the bench. He's joined by Justice Richard Feibel, who unfortunately is not a graduate of McGeorge, but never mind. <laughs> he's on the Court of Appeal of the Fourth, Fourth District in Santa Ana. And I do wish you were a graduate because I would call everyone's attention to the extraordinary accomplishments of your career, Justice Feibel. You were a partner at Morrison and Forrester before going on the bench and a graduate two times from UCLA. And I'm glad to see that my colleagues at UCLA have honored you sufficiently. Um, you have, I think, pretty much swept 
all of the awards they can give a graduate for distinguished contributions, and rightly so. And then lastly, but certainly not least, we have our professor and director of our Global Lawyering Skills Program, Mary Beth Moylan. Mary Beth uh, is a graduate of Case Western, and her significance on this panel is that she is our expert in campaign finance law and has also, in elections I should say, uh, was also along with Clark Kelso, one of the three members from McGeorge who had the honor of serving on the 90-member mem commission we're about to talk about. So Justice Roby, let's begin with you. You're going to give us a little bit of context and you're going to talk both about the commission and for those who are perhaps unfamiliar with the California system which has its own unique features, you're going to give us a little bit of an instruction on that as well and then we'll go to Justice Feibel and finally Mary Beth. Thank you, Dean. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today and talk about the uh, Commission for Impartial Courts, um, which was created by the Chief Justice in September 2007. Previously, a 2006 Judicial Council Summit uh, with experts from around the country had concluded that unless we took decisive steps, the problems in other states involving judicial elections and attacks on courts and judges by partisan and special interests could spread to our gorgeous and wonderful state. And the chief's response to that uh, summit was to establish the commission. And in establishing the commission, this is what he said. He said, we're forming the commission in response to developments in other states that have changed the tone, tenor, and cost of judicial elections. The manner in which judges are selected, retained, and removed from office can have a serious impact on the independence of the judiciary and it's essential that we make every effort to avoid politicizing the judiciary so that public confidence in the quality, impartiality, and accountability of judges is protected and maintained. The commission uh, consisted of a steering committee uh, chaired by Justice uh, Ming Chen of the California Supreme Court and four task forces organized around issues which had been uh, identified at the council summit. And those four task forces were judicial campaign uh, conduct, which was headed by uh, Justice Doug Miller of the Fourth District Court of Appeal, Riverside Branch, uh, judicial campaign finance, which was headed by uh, Superior Court Judge Bill McLaughlin of the Los Angeles Superior Court, uh, the Task Force on Public Information and Education, which was headed by Presiding Justice Judith McConnell from the 4th District. We've got all branches of the 4th District uh, in San Diego. And I was the uh, head of the Task Force on Judicial Selection and Retention. Um, as the Dean said, there were a total of 88 people involved mm -hmm. in this uh, steering committee and um, task forces, and as the Dean has said, uh, she was on the uh, Education Task Force, I believe, Mary Beth on the finance or campaign conduct, and Clark Kelso, I am proud to say, was on my task force. And um, the, uh, the way the, the commission operated is it had a meeting at the beginning of everyone and a meeting at the end of everyone, but the final decisions on behalf of the commission were made by the steering committee, which included the chairs of the um, task forces and then council members and a, lot of, and a number of people uh, from outside. Now, as you probably have heard, the final report was issued in December 2009 with 71 recommendations, uh, as, it, as the label says, for safeguarding judicial quality, impartiality, and accountability in California. Uh, I can tell you that, that we had more recommendations and they said, you know, this is gonna look ridiculous. So we combined several, uh, we uh, made several uh, recommendations out of one, so we only ended up with 71, so it's very uh, bite-sized. The um, <laughs> I'm going to briefly talk about um, the, uh, the two task forces that are not the principal subject of discussion today to set the context and then, um, and, and then move on to the uh, other. But uh, the task force on um, education concluded that there's a serious lack of civic education in California secondary schools. Uh, the council uh, had taken a number of surveys and found uh, Californians were abysmally uh, in ignorant of the judicial system in California. In fact, when I was presiding judge in Sacramento, 
uh, people couldn't uh, identify the judiciary. They, they thought it was the district attorney. Some people thought it was the probation department. Nobody knew quite exactly what the courts did. And, uh, and we found that uh, the actual amount of education that our high school students get on civics is, is really small. And what's happened is um, uh, students are being taught to the test, as you know. Now we have all this federal stuff. And uh, civics is not on the test, and as a result, uh, their, their civics education has deteriorated, so you really get very little instruction at all about the California court system. You get some discussion of the federal courts in famous cases like Dred Scott, you know, which is the kind of thing we should be teaching kids. And um, during this process with the Education Task Force, I can tell you that I was invited to appear before the Curriculum Commission in Sacramento, which was about to adopt a brand new uh, curriculum on civics education. And I spoke on behalf of the task force and recommended uh, a program that Judy's uh, uh, task force had worked on. And um, the commission responded after a couple uh, meetings with adopting a proposed curriculum. And then you can't imagine what happened. Governor Schwarzenegger managed to find the $500,000 dedicated to improving civics education in the budget and took it out. So we thought we had a great victory that we were going to improve the education of our kids about the courts. But anyway, Judy's task force concluded primarily that, that, that there is an immediate need to, for the public to understand. If we're going to have elections or even an a informed public debate about our court system, we have to have a public who has some idea what we're, ta what we're all about. And they also spent considerable time on the issue of developing a consistent response mechanism to deal with unwarranted attacks on the judicial process and included a number of recommendations in this area. Now, the Task Force on Judicial Selection and Retention started uh, at the beginning. Should we keep the California system of judicial selection and retention, or should we adopt some other merit system or other system? Now, a word about our California system. We have a hybrid system. We have a merit system. We have a system where everyone who is, a, uh, who, uh, is to be appointed by the governor has to go through the State Bar's Commission on Judicial Nominees Evaluation. And it has a statutory charter to consider a variety of factors and to uh, have a diverse and competent uh, series of recommendations to go to the governor. It is a open system, not a closed system. The merit systems from other states are basically a closed system. The commission in other states limits the governor to who he or she can appoint. In this system, the governor is still free to appoint people who are, if, if, necess if he does, who are found unqualified, for example, but everyone must go through it. We concluded that the California merit system, as exemplified by the Jenny Commission and the Commission on Judicial um, Nominations, which is headed by the Chief Justice and consists of the Attorney General and an Appellate Justice, was the functional equivalent of the kind of systems that are being advocated in other states. It's worked well, and we don't need to change it. So that was the fundamental recommendation of the California uh, Task Force, and the Commission adopted that recommendation. Now, as far as elections are concerned, we have elected trial court judges and retention elections for appellate justices at the Court of Appeal and Superior Court level. Now, what I think, because the public in California has been going so long with this system, they don't realize what our system's all about. We have basically no elections. We have probably 2% of the judges mm -hmm. in office who ever face election once they're appointed. And years ago, in Los Angeles County, we had 160 or so judges running every uh, two years on the ballot. Can you imagine what the public thought about having 160 people basically without opponents? It, it was a voter revolt. So under the present system in California, if a judge is unopposed, they don't appear on the ballot. So there are 20 plus judges in Sacramento County on the ballot this June. So we have essentially a, a kind of system that works. If you want to run against a judge, you can. We have an effective system for removing incompetent and 
judges and uh, uh, through the Commission on Judicial Performance, and so we have a good system. Somebody suggested and we considered whether we should have retention elections in California. The problem with retention elections is you still have to put them on the ballot. So instead of having 160 uh, people without an opponent, you just have 160 people with a yes or no answer. So retention elections are not the response for trial court elections in California. Finally, we did consider the ultimate, and that is the federal system of lifetime appointments and no elections at all. And that simply wasn't, it didn't have any support from anyone. Now, what about open elections? And there's one other remaining uh, element of the election process in California, and that's open elections. That's when the incumbent does not file for re-election and there are no incumbents and therefore the seat is on the ballot because there are no candidates absent uh, someone filing. In those cases, which we have a very small percentage, we did consider eliminating open elections so that there wouldn't be any uh, elections except those where incumbents were running. And there was a substantial opposition to that, primarily from elected judges who had been elected in the open election process over the years. But there are many people from groups that were underrepresented on the courts that felt that the only way they had a chance to become members of the judiciary were to run in open elections if governors and others would not appoint them. So there is an escape hatch in California, and it does result in most cases in greater diversity, I might add, and that is the open election process. So this part of our uh, program resulted in retaining the existing system. We did suggest some changes in the system to make it uh, better and to produce more diversity. But the other two task forces are the campaign conduct and election finance, and those are the subjects of our other speakers. Thanks very much. Justice Feibel, you're going to come up and, and talk to us uh, just a bit about um, disclosure, disqualification, and finally, uh, political endorsement of judicial candidates. I have technical assistance here, so this is great. Um, I would like to thank George and the Dean and uh, Professor Patton for inviting me here today uh, to talk about some of the work of, of the commission. Um, I do have a McGeorge connection that I do need to tell you about, and it's a very happy one. And that is, uh, back just a few years ago, when your assistant dean, Julie Davies, was practicing in Los Angeles at Morrison & Forrester, I worked with her, and she was a terrific lawyer, and uh, I'm very happy for her success here at McGeorge. And I just saw her come in the door, too, so it's even better. <laughs> We're lucky you didn't keep her. <laughs> That's right. Um, what I would like to do is to uh, dis address a few significant recommendations um, of the commission relating to the disclosure by judges and the um, proposals to mandate disqualification uh, of judges in connection with uh, their conduct in uh, campaigns for judicial office. And the first thing I wanted to do was discuss with you the existing law in California on disclosure and disqualification briefly because to understand what the recommended changes are, I think it's very important to understand what it is that we're dealing with and have been dealing with um, over the years. Um, the first thing to recognize is the current laws on disclosure and disqualification are contained in two places. Uh, one is in the California Code of Civil Procedure and the other is in the canons in the a California Code of Judicial Ethics. Now the California Code of Judicial Ethics is uh, promulgated by the California Supreme Court um, and that is pursuant to Article 6, Section 18M of the California Constitution. And that provision provides that the Supreme Court shall make the rules uh, for the conduct of judges both on and off the bench and for judicial candidates in the conduct of their, cam uh, of their campaigns. Now, it's also true that the California Constitution provides that the office of judges uh, is nonpartisan. So we're, we're dealing with a situation where we have two constitutional provisions here that uh, 
we start off with right, the bat, right off the bat. The code itself uh, covers disclosures by uh, trial judges and disqualification by both, of both trial judges and appellate judges. And the code also com contains commentary by the Supreme Court's advisory committee on the Code of Judicial Ethics. Now, that's an important point here that, that uh, many of these recommendations that have to do with amending the code, and, and they are the ones I'm going to review, um, will be recommended by the Judicial Council if they pass it, and three of them already have been. Um, but as I've just said, it's the California Supreme Court, not the Judicial Council, that has the authority to enact changes to the Code of Judicial Ethics. So what will happen procedurally is that the Judicial Council will, has approved three and will approve others to, to the extent it requires um, amendment to the Code of Judicial Ethics. The um, Judicial Council refers those to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court refers them in turn to the Advisory Committee. Uh, I've been fortunate for the last six years to serve as chair of that Advisory Committee. It has eight members and we are in charge of reviewing these recommendations from the Commission. We've also been charged with reviewing the recommendations of the ABA and their model code. That's a little blue book. It's, that's a little, actually, um, that the ABA has come up with. So we are reviewing now the, both the Commission's recommendations and the ABA code's recommendations and then make our recommendations to the Supreme Court. California judges, uh, state court judges, are not bound by the ABA code. They are bound by the California Code of Judicial Ethics. Um, when you take a look at the um, canons, and we've included all the California canons in your material, um, so they're actually in your book. I feel like being in, in church or a temple where I could tell you to turn to their pages, but we have the canons there. It's important um, that the, the preamble to the code recognizes the principle that we talked about all morning, that is our legal system requires independent and fair judges who honor and respect the judicial office as a public trust and strive to maintain trust in our system under the rule of law. So we're dealing both with these independence and accountability right in the preamble to our code. The Code of Civil Procedure also contains provisions pertaining to disqualification of trial judges. We've also included that in your material so you have easy access to it. And the key provisions of the Code of Civil Procedure, which are in your, your books, are sections 170.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, and 0.6. So I want to take a step back before we look at what the proposed changes are to, to ask, what is the existing law on disclosure by trial judges? Um, canon 3E2 of the uh, canons addresses disclosure um, by trial judges, and that is on page 17 of the canons. Um, canon 3E2 provides that in all trial court proceedings, a judge shall disclose on the record information reasonably relevant to the question of disqualification under the mandatory disqualification standards of CCP section 170.1. So this was changed as of January 1, 2008 to be an objective standard. Before it was more of a subjective standard, sort of what the judge thought. But now it's objective and it, it, it's tied into what is reasonably relevant to the question of disqualification um, under the mandatory sections of 170.1, which we'll, we'll get to in a moment. But so it's, it's tied to mandatory disqualification and what's reasonably relevant and that's what trial judges are obligated to disclose on the record in trial court. Appellate judges in California um, this comes as a, as a surprise to many, um, have no disclosure requirements at all. Um, we have, um, if we review the mandatory um, requirements for disqualification, we are obligated to recuse ourselves, but there is no disclosure requirement. And the, the answer to that, why is that, is that um, generally the first time um, the parties actually see appellate judges is when they come for oral argument. And that is pretty late in the process to be uh, disclosing things when you're literally about to hear their case and you've been working on their case for a couple months. Um, and to date, anyway, historically in California, we've really not had a problem with this. And so it's one of those, if you 
it isn't broke, why fix it? But there has been controversial over, over the years, and there have been proposals, um, the la last of which was probably about 10 years ago, um, to require appellate judges to, um, to have disclosure, but that went down uh, to defeat. Uh, so what are the provisions for mandatory disqualification uh, in California as they exist? Um, there are some very objective ones, and then there is one which you heard about a lot this morning about subjective. And you can take a look at 170.1, but basically a lot of these are very common sense. One would be that if the judge has personal knowledge of disputed evidentiary facts. Another would be if, if the judge was a lawyer in the proceeding. Third, and this becomes very important, if the judge has a financial interest in the subject matter of the proceeding or a party. And another portion of the code defines financial interest as $1,500 or above. And this will come into play when we talk about campaign conduct. A uh, judge is mandated to disqualify if he or she is related to a party or a spouse of a par or, or the spouse is. And then this is the key which we will constantly come back to. Uh, 170.16a believes that it, the judge believes recusal would further the interest of justice. The judge believes there's a substantial doubt as to that judge's capacity to be impartial, or subsection little three, which is the key, which is a person aware of the facts might reasonably entertain a doubt that the judge would be able to be impartial. So this is your objective, reasonable person standard, aware of all the facts. Um, it goes on, if judge is disqualified, if there's mental or physical impairment, or a whole new section if, if you've uh, engaged in prospective employment discussions with an alternative dispute resolution company, you can't be deciding cases dealing with arbitration or mediation or other alternative dispute resolution. So you come back to this 170.1A3, which deals with the person aware of all the facts, uh, would entertain a doubt as to whether the judge can be impartial. And um, the, the disqualification of appellate judges track 170.1. Basically, it's the same disqualification factors for appellate judges and uh, including the financial interest section. So now we'll turn to what other key recommendations that I'm going to talk about today from the commission. Uh, the first is number 29, which Professor Moylan is going to be really terrific here and put up on the board. Um, this is um, has been passed by the Judicial Council and would require disclosure by trial judges of campaign contributions of over $100. Um, the $100 is the reporting requirement of the um, state FPPC. Now that's the recommendation. Um, and I think that everyone involved in the commission and I think anyone who studied this uh, believes that a disclosure requirements by, by trial judges should be robust and timely and complete. Uh, the, the question, I think, will be whether or not the Commission's recommendation is expanded. Uh, that is really the only question, I think, that is open to serious debate. There's a strong argument to make um, reporting requirements um, of all contributions, regardless of amount. Uh, their, recommend, their arguments to make these extraordinarily timely, even more timely than the FPPC requires. There's a big issue that was touched upon um, in one of the panels uh, in Caperton, which is um, these recommendations talk about campaign contributions from a party or a lawyer or an interested person or an affiliate of a party. Um, and th this, is where the de this is where it really becomes difficult because it's a question of um, it's a contribution from whom, and the whole issue of independent expenditures, um, uh, and whether and then to whom. That is, it, does it go to a committee that's campaigning against you, or does it uh, um, against your opponent for you? So the to whom and from whom are going to become very, very important in the uh, debate over the disclosure um, recommendation. Number thirty which has been passed by the Judicial Council and has been referred to the Supreme Court, is disqualification of a trial judge for uh, $1,500 or more as a campaign contribution. Why $1,500? Because that's the amount 
it was, that is tied to an investment by a judge in a stock or a bond of $1,500 or more. So the thought is if you could, if the legislature, because it's in the CCP, has decided that's an amount that's meaningful for an investment, why shouldn't the same amount be uh, there for uh, contributions? The issues here, I think, are readily apparent. Um, we are in a big state. We have jurisdictions which are very small and which $1,500 would be meaningful. We have jurisdictions which are very large and which $1,500 um, probably wouldn't make a dent. And in Los Angeles, for example, it's been reported that just a ballot statement, that is to put your position on the ballot in the little statement in the booklet that goes to the voters is about $72,000. So, and then, and then it's the question of from whom? Do you aggregate all the contributions from a law firm? Do you aggregate all the contributions from a party? Do you, how do you do this? What if you have 100 contributions of $1,499? What is the impact there? So um, there's still the protection of, of the CCP section and the canons, which I talked about earlier, about what would a reasonable person, knowing all the facts, believe that there's a, a doubt can be entertained as to your impartiality. That's the catch-all. But the question is, and we, this is uh, open to a lot of debate, as to whether the $1,500 is the right amount. The ABA in their code has this section, and Professor Jay referred to this earlier. They, is, over dinner last night, he said, well, we punted. And that's true. Um, they, their section says you should be disqualified if you receive a contribution of dollar sign blank. And they, they recognize, I think, that in different jurisdictions, it could be a different amount. So that, those are the issues involved there. Um, and again, you have the same from whom to whom issues. Number 33 is disqualification of appellate judges. Um, and that is um, the amount would be different uh, for Supreme Court. The Supreme Court recommendation is it's tied to contributions to the governor. Uh, the same as the governor would be disqualified. Um, but is it realistic for courts of appeal? Again, we have different jurisdictions. Uh, the jurisdiction I'm in, District 4, covers Orange County, Riverside County, San Bernardino County, San Diego County, and many other smaller counties. Uh, you can't run a campaign in that kind of a, in that jurisdiction, really, without substantial contributions, or you could decide not, not even to run a campaign at all. But the question is, is $1,500 realistic? Um, I have two more recommendations to go over. One is number five, um, in Canon uh, 5B, uh, which is um, on page uh, 33 of, your, of the canons. Um, there's a canon that are, it already exists that says that a candidate for election or appointment to judicial office. So this not only covers people who are running for office, this covers if someone's having an interview with the judicial appointment secretary here in Sacramento. But those folks shall not make statements to the electorate or the appointing authority that commit the candidate with respect to cases, controversies, or issues that could come before the court, or two, knowingly or with reckless disregard for the truth, misrepresent the identity, qualifications, present position, or any other fact concerning the candidate or his or her opponent. This is a, um, California was fortunate. We, we had a, a code that, with the exception of about two or three words, um, really did comply with the Republican Party versus White. We did not have the announce clause. We have the commit clause. And what the proposal of the Judicial Council would be that if a candidate um, makes a commitment, um, which is already barred by Canon 5B, that that uh, person would be disqualified from hearing a case uh, on that issue. Um, this has some very practical import because if you're, you have two judicial candidates and one person you know, gets up and says, every case that comes before me, you know, every criminal case, I am going to institute the maximum sentence provided by law, every case, no matter what. The other person stands up and says, you know, you've just disqualified yourself from hearing any criminal case. So we're, if this, if this is passed. So it's, it has wide ranging effect, but it does address uh, Caperton address Citizens United where they talk about and where they uh, really refer to Caperton as look we're talking about uh, the speech in terms of money and donations and acceptance but we're not talking about recusal 
So this is an effort by, um, by uh, the commission and ultimately the Supreme Court will consider whether to say, you, once you make this commitment, you can't hear a case on that issue. And the final one I want to talk about is number 22. Um, if I were to predict controversy, this would be the one that I would at least think would be controversial. And that is, um, this uh, pr would prohibit seeking or using endorsements from political parties. I've already said that the Constitution says that judicial offices should be nonpartisan. But there's a 1984 California Supreme Court case uh, called Unger, um, in which the California Supreme Court held that the California Constitution does not prohibit political parties from endorsing judges in nonpartisan elections. This case was decided under the interpretation of the Constitution of California. It was not decided on First Amendment grounds, which is since 1984, since the Republican Party versus White, really been the, the uh, grant battlegrounds. Um, the ABA code has adopted this provision. They, they have it in place. And the commission recommended uh, to the Judicial Council that the commission, that the Judicial Council adopt it um, itself. Uh, should California adopt this prov provision? I would say that this, at a minimum, this uh, suggestion raises very significant First Amendment issues. Um, there's a 2008 Eighth Circuit case that held this provision to be unconstitutional under the First Amendment. Um, it is also perhaps problematic because while it addresses political parties, it does not address other special interests. So while, while you uh, would be prohibited from seeking your endorsements um, from political parties under this, it says nothing about other special interest groups. And you can just go through your mind all the special interest groups that you could accept and receive endorsements from, although it might impact your ability to whether you're really committing on issues. Um, but those are raises a whole panoply of issues. And I want to conclude on a congratulatory note because all these things, whenever they're put in the cannons or not put in the cannons, um, there, there's a new committee in California that has been appointed by the Supreme Court, which will issue judicial ethics opinions to judges at judges' requests or on their own motion or at the request of other interested people. And the, uh, the Supreme Court has appointed a committee to do that. And the first chair uh, of the statewide Supreme Court Committee on Judicial Ethics Opinions Another, is none other than your own Justice Ron Roby. So congratulations. If they give us some money, we could get to work. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you all very much. Um, th there's something that Justice Feibel said that I actually want to pick up on before I hit the recommendations that I was going to talk about today. Um, and, and that is that the disqualification provisions that he has been talking about, I mean, you can tell there was quite a lot of discussion, debate, the practicalities coming up against the First Amendment, coming up against um, the way things really work in the world. And one of the big issues on the disqualifications and the, and the low amount or the amount, or the, if you commit, you're disqualified, is the fear of people playing the system. So, okay, I really don't like, I'm sorry, Justice <laughs> Roby, but I'm just gonna use you as an example. Yeah, that's okay. I don't wanna be in front of him. He makes me nervous. I think I'll give 1,500 bucks to his campaign. So, you know, it can be played that way too as a strategic card, and, and that's the danger. You don't want litigants being able to say, well, either because I want to um, buy favor, curry favor with a judge, or because now my ticket to getting away from this judge and forcing a recusal is to give the maximum or in excess of the maximum campaign contribution. So that, that's one other piece of the disqualification debate and how we frame it and how you put something in place that works for our incredibly diverse state of 58 counties of wildly varying size and how you put something in place that both protects 
the ability of the judge to be impartial and protects the system from being um, played, for lack of a better word. Okay. Um, I also wanted to mention that the report that I was scrolling through with the 71 recommendations, the complete report as well as the list of recommendations is not in your packet. It was a, the complete report was 160 pages, I think, long, and the recommendations alone is, you know, a chunk of paper, but it is available on the courtinfo.ca.gov website. You can get it if you link to the Judicial Council website there. And I think we probably will, I'm not seeing Paul, but I think we probably will have a link to that um, on our website to make that available to people. So you can read the whole thing. We're highlighting a very few of the more controversial items that were discussed, the recommendations. And I will say it was a fascinating experience to be able to have these discussions with sitting judges and justices and to talk about this line where the First Amendment, I mean, all these cases that we've been talking about this morning, how they impact, the First Amendment jurisprudence impacts the ability to regulate ethics in this area. Um, it is fascinating and ideal to talk about the ethical judge and what is an ethical judge and how can we ensure ethical judges. But then, when you sit down and start saying, well, how do we enforce and how do we instill ethical decision making on people and on people who have First Amendment rights and on people who have practical concerns and in a state where our budget is such that we can't afford some of the great programs that might provide the training that we want to give. So um, it was a, a very interesting commission to be on. It, I think that what's remarkable is that with those 88 people, we, the, the commission ended up being able to reach some sort of consensus to make these recommendations. And a lot of them are, I would say, compromises um, after much discussion and debate. And um, so anyway, I'm going to get on to talking about the ones that I'm supposed to talk about. Before I do that, um, I, I think I know how to do this. No, I don't. Okay. <laughs> Do I hit it? Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, so in the report, for each of the tasks, task forces, sorry, I have a lateral lisp, and when I have that many C's and S's all at one time, it simply doesn't work. Okay. So there were some findings and assumptions that each task force presented. Um, our task force, Justice Bible and, and I were on the Judicial Candidate Conduct Task Force. And I think that I just wanted to throw these up there because I think it's important to say what were our, these are the assumptions, these are the findings that all of our recommendations kind of rest upon. Before we even start recommending things, here's where we can find some amount of agreement about what we believe to be true. So the first one, you know, that judicial quality and impartiality require that judges and judicial candidates be accountable to the very highest ethical and professional standards in connection with their campaign conduct. I mean, it seems an obvious principle, right? Except in light of our discussions this morning, even trying to get at what does that mean? You know, I think that, that remains a question. What is it to be held accountable to the very highest ethical and professional standards. Um, but we assume that that's what you need to have uh, impartiality, or I guess as um, Richard uh, Blevin, is that his last name? Devlin, Devlin said earlier today, maybe at least uh, reduced partiality. I liked that, right? We can minimize partiality if not actually achieve impartiality. Um, the second assumption was that although White raised concerns about the validity of any provision, the decision should be narrowly interpreted. 
so as not to prohibit restrictions on judicial campaign speech other than the announce clause. That assumption that we all went with is highly questionable in and of itself because there are several courts, several lower courts, that have said no, white is much broader, and white means, this is Republican Party of Minnesota versus white, and that case means that lots more than just announce clauses are unconstitutional. And there have been courts that have found that pledges and promises clauses are unconstitutional. There are courts that have found that commit clauses are unconstitutional. So this is an assumption we're running on that may or may not be true. At least in our jurisdiction, white has been not held to do anything more than prohibit announce clauses. Um, the next one is, I think, very important and really was a recurring theme for a lot of us in, on the task force, which is that the greatest threat to judicial independence comes from interest groups making significant campaign contributions and engaging in other campaign-related activities. We started our task force with the idea that campaigns in California to date have not been so bad. The idea of the commission was to be a preventative measure. We see what's happening in other states. We see the escalation of the contribution amounts. We see the escalation of interest groups in imposing themselves into judicial campaigns in a way that they've been doing in legislative campaigns for a very long time. And we don't want that to happen here. So it was really a, let's think about what steps we can take to ensure that those perceived harms that we have, that we see happening elsewhere, don't happen here. It was really a proactive approach. But the consensus was that if you start getting lots of money into your campaigns, if you start getting lots of interest groups doing independent expenditures and bringing politicking, you know, the, the legislative politics of campaigns into judicial campaigns, you're going to reduce judicial independence. So that was an underlying assumption. Um, next one, judicial candidates should be educated about the difference between judicial elections and elections for political office and about ethical campaign conduct. Nobody really disagreed about that. Um, ooh, okay. Um, we also, uh, you know, we're working with the assumption that at this moment in time, judges are prohibited from publicly commenting on pending cases in the course of campaigns, but attorney candidates are not. So that's just a reality, and how do you have a level playing field in a campaign when one party has an area they can comment upon and another doesn't? Um, this next one, uh, is, is sort of a big one and it relates to some of the stuff I'm gonna talk about in a minute. Judicial questionnaires propounded by special interest groups are often designed to elicit, elicit commitments and candidates who respond to these risk violating our canon 5B1, uh, which prohibits making statements that commit a candidate. So uh, I'm just gonna highlight that one right now and talk about it in a minute. Um, the use of slate mailers and endorsements raises issues regarding judicial ethics, including the appearance that a judge is endorsing other candidates and measures listed on the slate ma mailer. Everybody gets slate mailers, right? Everybody knows what, right, the glossies and like, you didn't really pay for it, but maybe they think you did and has a whole bunch of candidates and some have paid and some haven't, very misleading. Anyway. Um, I shouldn't say that out loud. Okay, um, <laughs> this, there's probably some Slate Miller person here. Okay, um, and then finally, misrepresentations by judges or attorneys can affect public trust and confidence in the judiciary. And ultimately, you know, I think that the the purpose of the commission for impartial courts was this idea that we want to find a way to make sure that we are keeping an ethical standard in judicial in the judiciary in California, from selection and retention through campaigns, through every part of it. Okay, so the couple of, of provisions that I wanna talk very quickly about are three of them that are going to be, uh, 
before the Judicial Council on April 23rd. The Judicial Council is actually taking up a number of these recommendations <coughs> on April 23rd, and the three that they're taking up relating to oversight committees are something that I think relate to um, the judicial questionnaires and some of these other underlying assumptions. And then also a couple relating to training. So recommendation 10 says that all judicial candidates, including incumbent judges, should be required to complete training on ethical campaign conduct. And in the morning session, um, I think it was Brad who said, we can teach to the system two biases, but can we get at the system one biases? And if we're trying to give ethical training, is it even possible? And I think that's a question that, I mean, my hope would be yes, we can, and the way that you would do that, and I'm not a behavioral scientist, um, is that you make someone conscious of the system one biases and then they become system two and you can, you can teach them. So my thought would be that this is the type of training that we are hoping will be done for all judges who are gonna be engaged in campaigns. Let's make it all, make you conscious and aware of how your campaigning impacts your ethics, your ability to be an upstanding member of the judiciary eventually. And um, so that is one recommendation. And the, you know, the only thing controversial about that is the mandatory part, of course, right? Um, people don't like to be told what to do. And I worked for a judge, and some judges in particular don't like to be told what to do. Uh, OK. Mine was fine. I'm just kidding. OK. Um, now, the, the other part of this is, in, in the more complete report, it discusses the fact that other states are doing this. New York and Ohio have mandatory training programs. Um, it does only apply to candidates who appear on the ballot. So if there's an uncontested election in the Superior Court, you're not going to have every judge in the state that's up for re-election having to go through the mandatory training. It would only be for judges appearing on the ballot. So. Um, that removes a number of trial court judges, of superior court judges from the list. Also, um, the recommendation in its more complete form suggests that there should be an online training available so judges in more rural or remote counties could complete it online and would not have to convene in the major cities to do this. Okay, so I, you know, I think this one is fairly non-controversial and particularly important as we talk about how do we ensure that at least at the inception of their process, if they're an attorney candidate or a challenger, or at least as a reminder to judges to be conscious of their ethical obligations within the context of campaigning. Okay, um, recommendation 11. This is the complement to number 10, which is what should judicial candidate training include? And you know, there's a list of things. The very first one, and the second one, and the third one, you're, you're seeing a pattern here, all relate to these judicial questionnaires. Well, why is that, and what are these, and why are we so concerned about them? The judicial questionnaires are like the other political questionnaires that special interest groups send out before an election to determine whether they want to endorse a candidate. And in the political context, um, they serve a function of, you know, being a litmus test of do you agree with the things our group agrees with and do we want to throw our money and our support behind you. And in the political context where you're electing representatives who are supposed to represent the people and constituents and constituencies, that makes some good sense to say, please answer our questionnaire and we will um, endorse you or not endorse you. In the judicial context, where you have judges who are under an ethical obligation through the code not to commit or make a pledge or a promise to decide a certain way on a case before that case is in front 
of the judge, having a questionnaire that says, what do you think about, name your big controversial issue, um, or you know, phrased more carefully, it, what's your judicial philosophy with respect to this or that, sometimes this is not a good thing. The role of the judge is not to cater to the constituency, it's to decide the case. And so these questionnaires have been um, a, a big concern for judges, and it's a nationwide problem that special interest groups are promulgating these questionnaires and placing judges in a very difficult situation because what happens if a judge says, I won't answer your questionnaire, I'm a judge? Anybody? See, I'm a, sorry, I'm an interactive teacher. This is very hard for me to lecture. Um, you're going to lose, right? You, now, now what do I look like? Sort of aloof, sort of I'm better than you and I don't have to answer your questionnaire, and I'm not one of, you know, I mean, I mean it just feeds the stereotypes, right, of the, the judiciary is not doing what the people want, right? But it's, it's a problem. So in other states, one of the things that has been done is judges have uh, instead written a letter saying, here's the role of the judiciary, this is what we are supposed to do, and here's why these questions are problematic for me to respond to. Or another thing that some judges did for a while in the first few years when this was ramping up was to respond to the questions by saying, the code of judicial conduct, canon X, prohibits me from answering your question. So then what happened? You lose and you get sued. So the, the, the <laughs> state, it's a double whammy. So, the, so there are challenges then to the canons of judicial conduct which have been asserted as what is stopping someone from speaking. And so in a series of lawsuits, some canons of judicial conduct were struck down as being a barrier to the speech rights of the judges who wanted to answer the questionnaire but couldn't. So now the message, the general message out there about questionnaires is don't mention the canon. Whatever you do, don't mention the canon. Just say you don't want to answer. Um, but this is a huge problem. And if you are someone who is new to the bench, say you've just been appointed, I don't know where he is, um, Judge Blizzard, is Thad still here? No, he was here this morning. He's a, a recently appointed Superior Court judge and a real good friend of our school. He was telling me this morning that he's been going to what is affectionately known as baby judge school, right? And he's been doing all this ethics training and they have a great ethics training program here in the state of California and he's been really enjoying learning all this, but he's not been through a campaign before, and hope maybe he won't have to, but if he does, our judges need to know and have some idea, what are the parameters? Should I mention the code? Should I not mention the code? How do I handle the politics of this? For the most part, people who are in this position of having to run for judge, to run for their job, am I done? Sorry, okay, I uh, can't yeah, just go on forever. Okay, <laughs> for, for the most part, they're not um, equipped for the politics of it. So this training and the idea behind the training is let's prepare them for the politics and, and help them to understand how the ethics and the politics coincide. Last thing, these are the ones that are gonna be on on April 23rd, seven through nine, the recommendations are for an unofficial statewide fair judicial elections committee and also for the continuation of unofficial local fair elections committees. The idea behind these committees is to combat speech with more speech. So if you have a situation going on, something unethical in the course of a campaign, the judge or the judicial candidate, him or herself, doesn't need to respond. Instead, there's a committee that can put out a, a press release, a public announcement that says this type of behavior, this type of campaigning is not 
ethical is not appropriate. And, you know, in that way, you allow the speech to combat the speech. Right now, we have Los Angeles County and Santa Clara County that have very vigorous, uh, unofficial, local, fair, judicial election committees, and they do this kind of thing, and it seems to be working very well. So the recommendation is to expand those and also to provide for an unofficial statewide committee. Sorry. Okay. Well, I want to thank the panel. Obviously, when you have a report with 71 recommendations, it is very complex. Um, I think um, the, when we get into the, the depth of the, of the recommendations, sometimes we, we may uh, get into rather technical areas that lack some of the passion that I feel this topic and all of us on the Commission felt needs. Um, Dustin uh, Johnson asked the question that I think was, was very much in the minds of those of us on the uh, task force on education and outreach, and that is that notwithstanding the Jenny Commission and all the good things one could say about it, we remain a very uh, monochromatic and indeed gender dominant uh, judiciary in California, a state that is as diverse as any in the nation. And I think there is then a real, if you will, kind of silent ticking bomb that the courts don't look like those they're serving. And Justice George, in his wisdom, and he, we are blessed with a wonderful uh, Supreme Court and a fabulous Chief Justice, is sensitive to the fact that we really do not have sufficient understanding of the importance of the court system. Indeed, the very name of the commission uh, spoke to that. It was called impartial court, pardon me, commission on impartial courts because independent courts are seen as runaway courts. And that to me was striking. The polls that were shared in uh, the task force that I served on were really startling as to how very, very little is understood about the judiciary and what a terrible problem we have. Now, our courts in California have done something in terms of education and outreach that uh, hopefully happens everywhere, but it was new to me, and that is they are reaching out, sitting in high schools, sitting uh, in various parts of the community to try and create a better mm -hmm. understanding and more immediate appreciation of how important uh, courts are to our entire system. But I do think there's a, a real uh, threat here that is very real, and it's back to my opening remarks why it's every uh, bit appropriate that any law school, every law school in the country should see itself as something of an action arm of the judiciary because, of course, the problem our judges have is that they can't really advocate for themselves. And so I think this commission was extremely uh, wise in its formation, trying to get ahead of what could be a real problem. Uh, the final comment before opening it up I'll make is that uh, in a school where we pride ourselves on being very global and so on, you, you do have the opportunity to see how courts are received and understood and function in other countries, and it's rather disturbing. Um, one wonders whether uh, we may one day inherit uh, some of those systems or some of their um, characteristics that we now try to educate. If you, if you think about uh, those countries where courts are really seen as low-level clerks, um, one gets the message, I think. We have a judiciary that really is, I think, the jewel of our, of our democracy, and unless we understand it and, and are aggressive in supporting it, we may get what we, we uh, deserve. So with those comments, a little heat uh, to the light that we've just had, I wonder whether we have questions for uh, this very distinguished panel over here. I always find these regulations in this area of law very frustrating because I think we have failed to just answer a really basic question, which is, are judges politicians or are they not? So we were talking this morning about this idealized vision of judging. We just call it the balls and strikes. We just apply the law to the fact, blah, blah, blah. If that's the case, then campaigns would not look the way that they do. But people want to know, not do you call balls and strikes, people want to know, do you think criminals have too many rights? Do you believe in a woman's right to choose? Do you think court judgments are too high? Blah, 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 blah. That's what they want to know. So as a result, judicial candidates end up trying to speak in code and try to answer those questions because they know that's what people want to know about in elections. And if we took seriously the idea that judges really do just call balls and strikes, we would go to some kind of merit selection and review process and not have campaigns. But if we're going to have campaigns, we ought to just admit that judges are politicians. Now, I don't mean legislators. I, I think that's a different thing. But we ought to just say, you know what? Look, we're politicians. And we should stop trying to put restrictions on judges saying things like, I think criminals have too many rights. We should just let judges say that. 
Um, on the other hand, if we think that's anathema to the judicial role, we shouldn't have elections. But we're stuck between these two conceptions of judging, and, and it, it makes this whole area so unstable and unsatisfying because we can't just decide the fundamental question, are judges politicians? Would all three of you like to make a comment on that? Well, I mean, I, I think that's, a, it's a, the point is very well taken. I think that uh, it, it, judges end up being politicians as long as you have elections. But frankly, uh, having uh, an imperial judiciary of, of people who serve for life is not a very good alternative. So that's why I think we're stuck with the, this, the situation the way we are, in my opinion. Um, I ran for election, I spent 24 years ago, I ran around this county being faced with questions like that. You know, What do you think about the death penalty and all that? And that was the year that the death penalty resulted in significant changes in our judiciary. So um, I think that um, I think that judges have to be politicians. If you, I mean, that's what happens. You go to a meeting uh, with the sheriff candidate and the assessor candidate, and they ask you political questions. And then all you end up saying is, I'm sorry, I can't answer. And they get mad at you because they say, how come you just came here and just stonewalled me? But uh, I don't want judges saying I think defendants have uh, too many uh, rights because then when they be, sit there with a case before them, you can say, well, they're gonna just go ahead and decide for the people every time. I don't want that. So I think that, that that's, I think, Professor, we're just stuck with that. So Justice Roby says we gotta tolerate ambiguity. That's what Freud tells us is the hallmark of a mature adult. <laughs> <laughs> Justice Fiber. <laughs> Well, I can't top Freud, so um, yeah. Let me let me try to answer that a, a couple ways. Um, the first thing is, you know, it, in our first meeting, and I think Professor Moylan remembers this because this was, you know, our task force. Uh, it took us not very long to conclude that our task force, as bright and wonderful as we are, and as many of us as there were, uh, we couldn't do away with elections in California on, on in judicial races. And so we moved from there to, even though I think if we took a vote in the room, we probably would have done away with elections, but easily. easily. But I think we moved, we just moved to the next step of, okay, you know, how can we best um, have regulation within the First Amendment and with other, with other laws? So that's kind of the reality. Um, in terms of, you know, are judges politicians? Uh, not in the sense, and that somebody made the point this morning about, you know, we, we don't represent a constituency. We, we try to do the best we can to follow the rule of law and, and use our common sense in doing so. But I will say one thing, which is um, I've tried to do, and I've noticed, and I read uh, opinions from other appellate judges throughout the state, and, and we have a more of an opportunity to do this than trial judges do. But, we, I, I'm, way I write an opinion, you can always, people tell me you, you could, you read the first page and a half and you know it's, it's mine, is I try to in, in explain the case in a page or less. And what the issue is, what the holding is, and what the reason we're holding it. And I am, I'm, I've, in, the, in the controversial cases that I've written, and I've written a few, I actually picture in my mind how will the public, how will, frankly, a newspaper reporter who is not a lawyer um, read this and understand it? And we, we, we have the luxury of time, what they call it this morning, the, the stare, to, uh, not the blink, but um, we have the opportunity to try to explain it in very practical, real terms of what we're doing. And in that sense, I wouldn't call it po politics, but I would call it sort of I need to explain this in a way where people will understand it, even if they're not learned in the law. So that, that would be my answer. I, I, I would just add to that because uh, people told us at public forums, I think the dean was there, they said, why don't you write your opinion so we understand them? Uh, and, and that was, to the extent the public knew anything about the courts, they didn't like what they read. And, and, I, and we made, a, we, uh, I make a conscious effort, I don't know how successful, but to do the same thing that, uh, that Rich does so that if somebody reads an opinion of mine, I hope they understand it for every page to the very end, and when they get to the end, they say, well, that makes sense. I mean, I consciously mm -hmm. think about that whenever I write, every one I write, and I think that that's part of this whole process of making ourselves more understandable to the public. Um, In fact, the uh, Task Force on Education talked about this yeah. and concluded that judges have a role to be educators as well. Correct. So your position then, Justice Freibel, is yes. 
judges, they're not politicians, they're educators. So Mary Beth, that would be over to you since you do a lot to help us with writing. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm sure that um, the externs that we send to Justice Roby help with those clear <laughs> opinions. Pretty common. You'd be surprised the darndest <laughs> difficult decisions they end up working on. <laughs> I, I really I don't have much to add. I mean, I think it's a it's a conundrum. I, you know, personally, I think it's a very difficult question, and uh, and I think that when you run for office, you are by definition a politician. So the 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 fact that we make our judges do it, I, I think then it, we are backpedaling. No, I think um, I mean the one you can't misrepresent your yourself. So um, it would it would depend. The, the, the twist there is that there are usually other regulations or laws that apply outside mm -hmm. of your area mm -hmm. that prohibit anything with foreign neutrality. But but the National Guard is a little trickier because they can be federal officers. Yeah. Right, and there's also, I mean, one of the canons is you abide by law, by any law. So that would, would apply, I think. No, no, why, I mean, no. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the canons uh, themselves are, if you violate a canon in California, you're subject to discipline. And that's in the constitutional authority for that is the Commission on Judicial Performance, and they have the constitutional right to do everything from privately admonish you to publicly admonish you to publicly censor you to remove you from office. Well, the Supreme Court does, yeah. And the Supreme is okay, subject to discretionary review by the yeah, Supreme Court. Yeah, it's now Court. subject to discretionary it's review. A discre what? No, a candidate. Yeah. One of the recommendations of one of the task forces is that the state bar discipline lawyers who are unsuccessful. Because if you're a successful lawyer and you violate the canons during the election, then the Judicial Performance Commission can discipline you after you take office. But um, the state, the problem is somebody who runs for election loses and just you know does all these bad things. Um, the, one of the recommendations is, is going to the bar, uh, hopefully will go to the bar from the council is that the state bar regularly disciplined lawyers for violating the canons during elections. That seems to me to be exceptionally sensitive because otherwise the incentives all work in favor of a lawyer who can be a bad actor in this thing and figures, you know. Well, I can do anything I want. Uh, yeah, and I think, uh, I think that's right. And that was one of the recommendations. We have so many, we didn't have a chance to talk about them, yeah. but that, that's an important thing because the playing field is certainly not level if judges have all these restrictions and candidates can go around throwing bombs anytime they want. The state bar is perfectly happy with that recommendation and they may end up just doing it anyway. Professor Chertoff, you've made something of a study of other jurisdictions. Is this commonly the case or is California in the lead here? Oh, no, you can't run no. unless you're a lawyer in California. And we you have to be 10 years as a lawyer. Right, uh, including New York. I mean, we have, uh, we eliminated non-lawyer judges 40 years ago, so um, everybody's a lawyer, and now there's a minimum of 10 years, as Rich said, for all judges. All right, we have time for one more question, if there is. Otherwise, I think I will thank the panel again uh, and hope all of you will pay attention, those of you in California, to the upcoming work of the commission or the, the council, I guess I should say, and the next meeting on April 23rd. If I could just add, uh, one thing is that uh, the uh, council is going to be considering all 71 over the next year. They, they have a meeting scheduled after the April one for June, one for October, one for December. They're going to plot to them all and get done with them early next year. Great. Thank you, Justice Roby.